and I don't. All right, we're pretty much ready to start, though. And we'll want to be uh, conscious of the fact that, um, for reasons we don't know, the uh, little lapel microphones for the room are not connecting. So if someone could, he, Darren may still find a way to make that work, but, but for the moment, we're going to have to just go with noisy people. That's not a problem for me, as all of you know. But be patient with the presenters who may not be used to being as obnoxiously loud as I am. <laughs> They've been around Scott, right? Uh, good point. Good, good, good point. <laughs> they, they are aware of Mr. Hanselman, yes. Oh, and to that point, as you well know, Mr. well, you don't know this whole story. Scott approached me earlier this year and said, hey, I've got these two awesome people working on ASP.NET Core, and I'd love to have them come down to Portland to present to the best user group on the planet. That is approximately what he said. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not embellishing too much. Not a quote, but it's not overly embellished. And I said, heck yeah. So he arranged for them to come down and uh, present to us. He was going to be here to coach and rah-rah with them, but then he got called to his homeland, Scotland. And so he is on his way to Scotland right now. <laughs> so there you go. So we, you can send him nasty grams and stuff. Thank you, Craig, for the <laughs> bottom tush. Yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> so, Padna, you've been here before, several of you. Here's a few places to find us. I like to promote, especially to anyone who is currently watching the stream or is soon watching it, subscribe to the, to the channel so we can uh, be more visible on YouTube because there's other people who will benefit from our presentations too. <clears throat> You, of course, can find us on Twitter and LinkedIn and stuff like that. Did that flicker up there, too, or is it just my screen? This screen has problems, for sure. You probably saw the green on me, though, right? Yeah. Special effects, don't worry about it. If you haven't already connected to the guest network, I'll give you a few moments to take a picture or type that really fast. Hold up your phone so you, I know you're looking. Okay. You done, Jason? <laughs> you were my sparrow in that case. Canary in a coal mine if you want. <laughs> and my screen is totally green. Okay, so Microsoft, the very reason we are here is because Microsoft makes tools that we all enjoy using. Intel provides this awesome space tonight. Now, every, every time we meet, I try to remind people, please clean up your space. I want to emphasize that more this month because they have something early in the morning and there may or may not be a chance for the cleaning crew to hit it. So before you leave this evening, please take a moment to look around and see if there's anything that you can pick up and, and uh, leave this place neater than we found it. Thank you. SureWeb provides space on the web for our, our site. At no cost. So Thirsty Lion, a very regular sponsor for our group. They also are where we go afterwards and we'll be talking about that again in just a second. We have gift cards to give away from them. Plural site, uh, I don't have any plural site items. We do have JetBrains items. Now, a lot of you are used to the idea of Nona Emilia Pizza. I hope you enjoyed it. It was not Nona Emilia Pizza tonight. They are currently having a remodel of their facility. And so I had to go to their cousins, or actually a husband, technically. For those who don't know, Emilia is grandma, Ernesto is grandpa. So <laughs> Ernesto, who that restaurant was owned by the brother of the guy who owns Nona Emilia's. He sold to another guy. This guy was able to provide pizza tonight for us when we didn't have our Nona Emilia's. And as a bonus, he even delivered it. So that was pretty awesome. I told him, feel free to bring some menus and stuff. Not only did he bring menus, but he included pens with those menus. So feel free to grab one and go visit. If you are not a Beaverton Hillsboro person, you might like it because it's even closer to Portland. <laughs> So that's, that's a bonus for several people. I suspect Nona's will be back with us next month, though. So we have sponsors. New Relic, I know you're here. Matt? There you are. <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm Matt. I'm part of the recruiting team here in Portland. Um, currently, I have a few different roles I'm working on. Uh, if anybody's working on Node.js or React, 
Um, I have a senior engineer role open on one of our agent teams, as well as a mobile-focused role on iOS uh, and full-stack development. I'll be at the after party as well if anybody wants to chat. Uh, Adroit, do we have someone from Adroit tonight? No? Okay. Uh, Vanderhauen, I know I've seen that yep. person. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Andrew with Vanderhauen. Um, I've been hanging out with you guys for a while now here at PadNug, and we've been doing this in Portland for a long time. Uh, I've met a lot of you, but not everyone, so feel free to, to come say hi. I'll be at the afterwards. Cool. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, SoftSource, I know, is here because I am here to represent them for the moment. Uh, SoftSource is hire, actively hiring positions in the Microsoft development world. You can be a not Microsoft person, too, because we've done other stuff. Uh, I will also mention Vanderhauen's been kind enough to throw in a couple gifts for us on Swag tonight. And I'm also thrilled to say we have a, y'all know we're doing the streaming stuff. We now have a computer for doing that, and SoftSource donated that to us. It's an older one. I'm not saying they went out and bought one for us, but, but it was kind of cool. Home Depot. Have I seen Home Depot today? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Center. Lumber or hard? I'm oh, sorry. Yes. We're quote Center. We're actually in Vancouver. Uh, we're a small division of the Home Depot, working in the pro customer space, not the DIY space. We got .NET Core. We got Node. We got React JS. We got Cassandra. We got Elasticsearch. We got a lot of really cool stuff going on. We're expanding like crazy. We've been hiring like crazy. <laughs> we have some open positions. We'll be at the Come check me out. Excellent. So if someone was tired of their work at Microsoft, for example, they could come down to Vancouver. Anyway, I will not admit that, even if Scott sees it. <laughs> Tech Systems. That's me. Yeah, there you are. Hi. So we're always hiring. Um, we've got everything. We've got a lot of data analysts. We have a lot of straightforward .NET, anything from manufacturing to healthcare to Nike. Everybody thinks Nike's only Java, but they have a ton of stuff <laughs> as well. Um, come see me. I will this time be at the after party, <laughs> and we will be buying everyone a drink. So, Whoa! Uh, Do you see how big the group is? I don't know if they have room for this many people. To, okay. <laughs> we'll make it work fine. We'll see? Look, work you get free. <laughs> um, Eve, yeah. Mom and Dad get it too? Oh. <laughs> Anyway, awesome. thank you, Danielle. Uh, Robert Half. We're back there you are. Hey everybody, I'm Steve. You're always Robert at Half, uh, world's largest oldest staffing firm. Uh, we're always looking for .NET people. I've actually got a new role that just came down today. So if you're a full stack uh, .NET developer, we'd love to have a chance to talk to you about our new open requisition. I've already met you. My anyways, it's an update. Um, database administrators, database developers, kind of a big thing right now. But uh, we look forward to meeting everyone. Thank you. And IT motives. Well, you know. I'm here. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I, I should have gotten him because he's sitting in the normal place. You are way off from yeah, where I'm expecting. Okay. Coast coast. <laughs> um, my name is Elena. I'm with IT motives. Uh, we're one of the smaller companies, but we definitely have uh, a relationship with Padnug and with lots of different user groups in the area because we like to meet people. We like to build relationships and we're passionate about technology. So um, I'd love to say hi. You be afterwards? I believe I will be at the after. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, anyone else out there have anything they'd want to share? Job opportunities? Employment opportunities? Yeah, I'm Jesse. I work at uh, Kindergare, and we have three open full stack positions. Uh, so if you're interested, come talk to me afterwards. Jesse will probably be afterwards, too. Huh? Probably. Uh, I work, work at DAT Solutions, and we're looking for some uh, new people, so come talk to me too afterwards. Cool. And you will be afterwards. Cool. Hey, James. Um, I work for Treehouse, which is an online education company based here in Portland, and we're looking for a teacher with back end programming experience. It could be Java, Python, or even .NET, if that's your thing. So, <laughs> if you're interested. Nobody here cares about that. <laughs> yeah, if you're interested in learning to teach people how to program, beginners, hit me up. Excellent. Good. Going once, twice. All right. What's coming? Willamette Valley Software Engineers. Alina, you don't happen to know. Angelo usually gives a plug here. Adrian's coming to present, though. Adrian's awesome. So 
if you uh, several of us went down to see Hanselman last month in Salem and it was actually the da trip down was a little <coughs> slow but the trip back was blazing fast it was awesome so it was worth going down uh, I recommend it they have a great little group down there October 17th and is uh, the West Side Geek Dinner. Yeah, we have Geek Dinner down here, by the way. Y'all should just hang out. Mom, Dad? Uh, geek Dinner at the Washington Square Thirsty Lion. Uh, that, that's a good, always a good time. Uh, October 18th, Portland Mobile. Anyone a regular attendee with the Portland Mobile group that knows what might be happening? No? Okay. Agile PDX, also on the 18th. That's the uh, formerly XPDX, the XP people, the extreme programmers and agile people. October 23rd. This may be a little more of a journey for y'all, but uh, Central Oregon over in Bend. Dave Harrison, who's come to present to us many times, he's got a gig starting over there. Apparently, they're just going to start in a bar and work, work from there. So <laughs> that is, it's a, it's a journey, but it might be worth it. <laughs> And, and Dave has property. You might be able to take a tent. We'll, get, we'll, we'll see what we can work out. <laughs> uh, then October 24th, Padnug on the east side. Here's a twist. So s several people have been coming out since we've moved to the Grand Central bowling space for our um, geek dinner. This month, we're thinking we might actually go bowling. So if you <laughs> like to bowl or like to hang out with nerds, <laughs> either way, Come on out. Uh, we, I, I suck, so you don't feel bad. I, I'm lucky to break 100 when I go bowling. And so, but I own my own ball. That's how, that's how much fun I consider, excuse me, consider that. Yeah, I know. Well, there was a time I got up into the 150 to 200 range, but that's, that was a long time ago, I, I must say. So then, Portland TypeScript. Uh, we have two talks this month. We have a new location, too, so uh, Gerald. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to be at SureScripts on the west side. What? Yeah. Way over here? So Patna is going to be on the 24th downtown, but we're going to be <laughs> on the west side. Um, How perfect. Yeah, 185th and Walker Road. So yeah. come, come check us out if you never want to make the trip downtown. We're now on the west side. You can go to Thirsty Line afterwards. Uh, we could. <laughs> um, you could walk. Talks. Uh, UI Fabric, which is a Microsoft open source project that combines like React and TypeScript that gives you the ability to create apps using an Office look and feel. Mm -hmm. um, never saw it before. Anyone here use Office uh, UI Fabric? No. <laughs> use Office? Yes. No, UI Fabric? No. <laughs> it's like Bootstrap, but Office. Look and Interesting. Feel. I'm sorry. Um, and Elm, which is a statically type checked functional language that compiles down to JavaScript, so it runs everywhere. Sounds like TypeScript, <laughs> but different. It's not TypeScript. <laughs> Excellent. Come check it out. Awesome. Let's see, 26, Portland SQL Server User Group. Dennis, you know, oh, Tim, you, you uh, might know. I mean, I did see you briefly. Go ahead. Yeah, so you uh, share? we're actually in a new home, uh, 217 and I-5 at Pacific Sword of Health Plans. And have a presentation coming up this month on SQL in the Azure Cloud. Yeah, okay. Cool. Thank you. Glad you're here for it. Let's see. November 7th, we have Jeremy Foster coming back down. Uh, he's going to expand on last month's presentation about bots and, and uh, cognitive services. Then we have Geek Dinners in November, of course, too. And that is what's coming. Now, finally, if any of you don't happen to know where the Thirsty Lion is in Tannisborn, Pretty much get on Cornell Road and go east until you get to Macy's, and it's over there. How many people fairly sure you're going to go, especially with Danielle's offer? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to call them and might bump up a little bit. <laughs> with little further ado, does anyone else have something? Yes. What? Okay. So free event. If anyone wants to go, there's beer and pizza. Is that on Meetup? Yeah. Send me a link later. I will. Okay, thanks. Thanks. All right. So let me just wrap it around just to make it easier to introduce. Jazz and Mikhail have come down from the Great White North, called Seattle-ish. 
<laughs> Redmond, to present to us this evening about ASP.NET Core. Thank you very much. If you'd like both of them, this little box has a button and you can switch back and forth. Yeah, if you I don't want to do that, that's what you're saying. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mikhail Mengistu. I'm a software engineer on the ASP.NET Core team. My name is Jazz, and I'm also a software engineer on the ASP.NET Core team, but I'm on the MVC side of things. Uh, here you can just see our Twitter handle, so if you have any questions later on or want to keep up with the projects, they're not official work accounts, but we do tweet a lot of stuff related to work. So anything that we say is just totally our opinions, not officially work stuff, but um, also, as Rich mentioned before, unfortunately, Scott Hanselman can make it. But um, Mikhail here is also a Portland native, so a few years from now, you can say, I went to his first talk when he's like Hanselman as well. So he's like the replacement. <laughs> and as a punishment for Hanselman not being here, any questions you have, just tweet directly to him, so he'll handle it. Already started. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Follow his lead. Um, all right, so a little bit about myself. So I graduated last year um, with a degree in bioinformatics. I went to school in Vancouver, BC, the real one. <laughs> Just kidding. So um, I gra graduated last year. I have been an intern at Microsoft for three summers. Uh, and then I started working in September 2016 on the ASP.NET team. So yeah, again, I'm Mikhail Mengistu. Uh, I graduated in 2016 with a degree in computer science from MIT. I was a previous intern on what was the ASP.NET 5 team before they switched to core. Uh, yeah, like Jas mentioned, I'm from Portland, Oregon. I'm really glad to be here tonight. Yeah, thank you for coming. <laughs> All right. Cool. So just to start off, we're just going to talk a little bit about what is .NET Core. .NET Core is our cross-platform open source implementation of .NET. Uh, open source and cross-platform aren't generally, that throws me off, the, the screen here like goes Hulk and turns green and it's like really <laughs> distracting. Uh, so uh, .NET Core is like our open source cross-platform implementation of .NET. Uh, open source and cross-platform aren't generally things that you would associate with Microsoft, but it's really promising and interesting to see the great new direction that we're moving. Uh, Satya Nadella, our CEO, just released this book called Hitting Refresh or Hit Refresh, which sort of kind of talks about how Microsoft kind of moving into the future. And that was really sort of one of the things that sort of drew me back to join the team full time, just seeing the interesting <coughs> direction that we're moving in. Okay. How many of you guys have heard of the term .NET standard? Okay, great. So. Um, some, some people find it confusing. So .NET standard is not actually a framework itself. It is a specification that all of the app models um, abide by. So uh, .NET framework, .NET core, Xamarin, all of these have the common denominator of .NET standard. So the libraries that you uh, create are portable across all of these app models because they use the same set of APIs. Here you can see our like very cliche uh, diagram to explain .NET standard. We use it in all our talks just because it actually really does kind of display the topics pretty well. You can see the different app models, uh, .NET Framework, .NET Core, and Xamarin, and how they all sort of are sitting on top of the .NET standard library. And the idea is what the team did was they sort of looked at the intersection of the .NET framework and the Xamarin APIs and used that as sort of a guideline for what APIs they wanted to add into .NET Core so that they could all follow the same basic contract, which we call the .NET standard. All right. um, so .NET Core 2.0 actually just released back in mid-August. And compared to the 1X .NET Core, there are about 20,000 more APIs in .NET Standard. And um, 
about 70% of all NuGet packages are now compatible with .NET Standard 2.0. So um, um, the chances are that any package that you wanted to use or anything from .NET Framework that you were aware of is also usable with .NET Core as well now. Yeah, no, this is just really big because as a developer on .NET Core, when you're targeting like the .NET Standard 2.0, you have so many more of these NuGet packages that are now available for you to use. And if you find something that fits your needs, that's just less code for you to write. So what is ASP.NET Core? So this is the team that we work on specifically. It's our, again, I'm going to use these words a lot, cross-platform open source web framework. Uh, you can build web apps, uh, services, mobile backend, and you can run this on .NET Core or uh, .NET Framework. So uh, that also means you can develop on Windows, <coughs> Mac, or Linux. So just to get a sense, how many people are using .NET Core for work or just have tried it out? Okay, awesome. And just uh, out of curiosity, how many people are not developing on Windows? Okay, interesting. No, awesome. Uh, yeah, so that's just really sort of a huge draw for Core, right? Is that you can, you can if you want, develop on Windows in Visual Studio, or you can write on your Mac uh, in Visual Studio Code. I've made like a couple of YouTube videos describing some uh, small basic things that you can do with ASP.NET Core, and I always sort of make it a point to do it on my Mac and not my Windows machine just to sort of show that you can do it, and it's not like just for show, it's like you can actually develop with it. Um, do you want to talk about the renaming? Oh, yeah, sure. And so you'll notice that it's ASP.NET Core versus ASP.NET 5, which it was when I interned in the summer of 2015. And so it was interesting because Hanselman wrote this article after the rename happened, and it was like this super clickbaity title called like ASP.NET 5 is dead. And I was super worried because I'd already gone back to school and I see ASP.NET 5 is dead and I'm worried like I'm out of a job. <laughs> and, but if you, if you just Google ASP.NET 5, you'll see he sort of goes into detail about how it, the, the 5 naming didn't really make sense because it wasn't necessarily a next step from the .NET Full Framework 4.6. It was a redesign and rewrite. So it's more, it's not necessarily a next step so much as a different path, which is why the core branding makes more sense. So yeah, we're gonna just go over some of the things we're gonna talk about in this talk, new things in ASP.NET Core 2.0. Really briefly, we're gonna talk about our uh, uh, cross-plat web server, Kestrel, which is now supported on the edge. Uh, I work specifically on the SignalR team within ASP.NET, so I'm going to talk about this, the new version of SignalR. Uh, it's now compatible with ASP.NET Core. It's a total rewrite from the previous version, so I'm going to go over a couple of demos and I'm going to go really sort of into that. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the runtime store. And then Jess, you want to go? Yeah, so um, we wanted your experience of publishing through Azure um, to be better with 2.0. The runtime store was a solution to that. So the runtime store is the store that all your applications use. So each of your app doesn't need all of the ASP.NET DLLs anymore. We'll show a demo, but um, basically there is a meta package that contains everything ASP.NET related in it. So uh, you don't need to add references to everything. So you don't have to worry about what version it is. Um, and uh, it basically allows you to publish your app as just your app, and you don't have the overhead of all of the ASP.NET DLLs anymore. So your uh, published output is much smaller than it was in 1x, so which allows your app size, app footprint to be much smaller on the cloud, which can be really useful. Um, and then we're going to talk more about Razor Pages. How many of, of you have heard of Razor Pages? Okay, great, you guys are all on top of things. So Razor Pages is a new coding paradigm. It's not supposed to replace MVC. MVC serves a different purpose, but Razor Pages is still built on top of all of the good things that you know of MVC. But for someone starting out, um, there could be uh, a lot of failure points with MVC's conventions, and we wanted to address that with Razor Pages. So I'll show a quick demo later, and I'll write some code so it makes sense. But Razor Pages are, uh, like 
script pages that can evolve into MVVM model based uh, pages and um, they're just easier to learn and get started with but they provide all of the good things that you know of MVC so all the things you know still apply um, what else all right so uh, also tag helper components so with 2.0 there are a lot of um, feature enhancements and bug fixes as well and one of the things that I worked on uh, was tag helper components and uh, Tag helper components are similar to tag helpers, and they're a way to modify your HTML elements. So you can um, target the head HTML tag or the body HTML tag, and the most common user scenario would be injecting scripts based on certain logic of your application. So you could be in a view, in a controller, and you would want certain conditions to um, decide if you're injecting certain JavaScript, let's say. So tag helper components provide you with an easy way to do things like that. Um, and the last thing we'll, we'll go over is application insights. So application insights um, is a tool to provide you with rich diagnostics about your application. So it's, uh, it's on by default for ASP.NET op applications. So um, you get to see your app's performance and how users are using your app um, in VS and uh, and in Azure. So. Yeah, so here are just a couple of links. We're going to show the web pages for how to get ASP.NET Core. Uh, uh, Well, do you, I mean, most of you guys are already using it, but just for those who aren't, it's a get.asp. There we go. Net. We hope you've seen this before, because that's where you get .NET Core. Um, so if you go to the downloads page, um, you can choose .NET Core or framework. Um, and if you scroll down, you have all of the different di distributions for Linux, for Mac, for Windows, um, and now, you can install the 2.0 SDK and runtime. So that's how you get the bits. But if you are interested in, ex in experimenting with the latest bits, we recommend that you definitely check out us, check out our GitHub repository, ASP.NET. And uh, this is where you can stay up to date with what's happening right now and what's coming up in the future. So if you want to try our bits out, definitely take a look here. This is also where you would go if you have any feature requests, any bugs that you need to report or any pull requests that you really want to contribute. Um, um, I'd like to point out that we really appreciate those. Um, so any feedback that we can get from you, it, it's great. So please definitely check us out on GitHub. Yeah, that's one of the really cool parts about our job is we get to work on this open source project and there are people just like out in the world that just come and will say like, oh, hey, I'm seeing an issue with this. And that's something I have to like just go investigate. The real like sort of interactions that I get to have with customers, whether it's, oh, hey, I'm super upset because of this, or hey, I really love this. And so there are lots of people that also do like make pull requests for features that they want or like bug fixes that they see. So it's that's really a sort of a rewarding part of our job is just to see how much people appreciate the product and mm -hmm. seeing their level of engagement with it. Yeah, even if I get a bug reported on something that I wrote, it's still a good feeling because I'm like, hey, at least someone's using what I wrote. So that's really exciting to me. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> please, please keep keep us engaged. Okay. Another thing would be um, this is where you get Visual Studio. Um, we will be doing most of our demos in Visual Studio, but definitely you can do all of the things we're doing in Visual Studio Code um, as well. And I think that's. Okay, awesome. So yeah, just super briefly, uh, Kestrel is our cross-plat web server. It is a fairly new web server, but it's really performant, and it's something that we really take a lot of pride in. If you've followed any of the like Tech and Power benchmarks, uh, it's been doing really well lately. And basically what we've been doing a lot of work in 2.0 to make Kestrel edge ready. And just because it's such a new server, like relative to something like IS, it wasn't actually officially supported as an edge server in our 1.0 release. But now you will be supported. 
Uh, we've done a lot of work for setting different options for Kestrel. So now you can set uh, things like the max client connections, max request body size, and then min request body data rate. So these are just some of the things that we've done. We've done a whole ton of investigation and always uh, security investigations and a lot of perf work just to make sure that Kestrel continues to mature and it eventually becomes incredibly popular. So now onto what I do regularly, uh, SignalR. So SignalR is a real-time web framework for .NET. Uh, the tagline that we use is incredibly simple real-time web for .NET. Uh, it's basically just provides an abstraction layer for a persistent connection between server and client. It's like an RPC library and you get uh, a hubs API for server-based push to web clients. Uh, it basically just gives you real-time functionality in your ASP.NET. Uh, here's a simple architecture diagram for uh, at the bottom levels you have the ASP uh, net core abstractions for so you have your web host and your middleware pipeline and on top of that we have like the transports so web serve web sockets excuse me service set events and long pulling which uh, handle the communications between that and your hub endpoints and your hubs are your programming layer which you can use to invoke methods on your client or server and so what we have that's new in this version of SignalR is first and foremost compatibility with ASP.NET Core so this is a complete rewrite of SignalR uh, how many people have used any previous versions of SignalR oh, okay awesome cool good to see uh, so yeah this version is compatible with Core it's plan to be released in with the 2.1 cycle of ASP.NET Core, so keep an eye out for that. But currently, the Alpha 1 version is available on NuGet, so if you're excited and want to use it, uh, we're still like doing a ton of work on it, but it's available and it's pretty stable. Uh, Alpha 2 will be coming out soon as well. We're working on that right now. Uh, so what else is new? We have an in-the-box Redis-based scale-out for SignalR, so for your uh, handling different, uh, using SignalR across multiple machines. Uh, we have a new streaming API from server to client. There's a really cool sample on uh, one of our repos. We have a dedicated SignalR samples repo. It's at GitHub ASP.NET SignalR dash samples, which has, has a lot of cool stuff. The stock ticker sample, which is really cool, has a really good example of using that new cool streaming API. Uh, this version of SignalR is not really limited to HTTP. We, in this redesign, we sort of wanted to make SignalR, one, one of the beautiful things of SignalR is how simple it was to use, but we also really wanted to focus on making it really extensible so you could also do more complicated things if you wanted to. Uh, there's also uh, the JavaScript client, which is written in TypeScript. And you can also uh, use the TypeScript client. There's a really great blog post written by my teammate, sits right next to me, his name is Pavel. Uh, if anyone wants a link to that, you could just tweet at me and I'll send it out or maybe I'll give it to Rich and he can send it out. But he has a, a couple of actually really good blog posts where he describes the SignalR uh, JavaScript and TypeScript clients really well in depth. Uh, and now, so what's gone from SignalR? So I guess the first one is a good thing that's gone. Uh, we've removed the jQuery dependency. Uh, so this is something that was really heavily requested that we take out. Uh, I guess I was still like in high school at the time, but five years ago, uh, apparently it was super uh, requested, or it, was, it made a lot more sense to have the jQuery dependency, but now we've removed it. With the jQuery dependency, it was pretty difficult to use SignalR, uh, the JavaScript client of SignalR outside of the browser. But now you're able to use SignalR in like a, a node app like from the console. There's also another super great blog post by my teammate, Pavel. Uh, definitely check out his blog if you're interested in SignalR. He basically shows how to use the JavaScript client from the console in a node app, which is super cool. Uh, we have a simpler connection model. So we don't have automatic reconnects. So uh, essentially, that also means that sticky sessions are required for uh, multiple service scenarios. So what that essentially means is if you're, you have connections distributed over multiple machines, 
Uh, if one of those connections goes down, it'll actually have to reconnect to that same machine. Uh, we have no transport fallback. So when you're requesting to connect to the server, if there's no, if that server doesn't support that transport that you've initially requested, you'll have to spin up a new connection and uh, essentially you can, you can implement transport fallback yourself, but it introduced some complications that it made more sense for the user being the developer to implement that. Uh, yeah, there's no uh, hub state, so there used to be a uh, like hub state bag that you could pass back and forth. I'm not super, super familiar with the older version of SignalR as, yeah, I was in school. I've only, I, we've been on the team for like a year now, uh, but I only started working on SignalR probably like six or seven months ago, so I'm still like kind of jumping into it. Uh, there's, uh, we don't have support for a forever frame anymore, and there's no uh, progress message support as well. So for actually using SignalR, we have the alpha, like I mentioned, the alpha one is available on NuGet right now. It's pretty stable. Uh, one thing I always find interesting is that people will go on our GitHub and say, hey, something's wrong with the alpha. It's on our like production servers. We need you to fix this immediately. And I'm like, what are you doing? Stop. Uh, so definitely don't use it in production at this point. Uh, it, like I mentioned, it'll come uh, fully featured RTM with the 2.1 release of ASP.NET Core. But yeah, I mean, as the name suggests, it is an alpha version. Uh, can we wait till the end for questions? Cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, so on the server side, we have this uh, package reference. Basically, you could, I'll show you how to do it a little later, but this is the only dependency that you'd add to your CS proj for using SignalR on the server side. And then the SignalR client, we have the JavaScript client, which is distributed over NPM. Uh, so yeah, that's the command that you would run, and it would download all of the different uh, versions of the SignalR client. So we have like uh, an ES5 version, and there's all they all have minified versions as well. So you could just copy that over to your whatever place in your project directory that you'd want it to be in. Uh, we also have a C# -sharp client available on NuGet.org. Uh, it's called Microsoft ASP.NET Core dot signalr dot client. Uh, I'll show that to you in a minute as well. Yeah, or no, that's fine. So I'm going to plug in and I'm going to get this perfectly smoothly working demo going. Because demos always go exactly as planned. Okay, can everybody see that? Should I make this a little larger or <laughs> better? 150. Please tell me you have Zoom in installed. Um, next question. Sticking <laughs> Scott on you. Okay, so what I'm going to show is for this demo is just a super simple chat example. We have two demos. Chat is the warm-up demo, just so we can see how to bring in SignalR, how to configure it in your application. So I'm gonna show you a really quick demo of the browser client, and or the JavaScript client, and the C-sharp client. So here we've got our server app. And so in configure services, what we're gonna do is we're going to add signal R. And then what we also have to do in <coughs> configure is first we need to add. Oh, yes. Where are they? Oh, use, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> use file server so that we can serve this index.html file that's in our www root folder. And then we need to use signalr. Mm. 
And then what we have to do is, on this routes object, we have to actually map our hub. So I've got a chat hub that still needs some implementation that we're gonna go finish in a second. And we're just gonna map this to chat. Cool, so this is what we have to do to set up our services and our middleware pipeline. Now, let's move over to chat hub. So we've got this class, chat hub, which implements or it sends the hub class and then we've got this class send and in it we're going to on clients.all we're going to invoke the send method and we're going to pass in the message that we get and so right, we also need to await this forget that every time so this is essentially all like the server code that we need. I know a lot of you are familiar with SignalR, but there's also uh, another way to do this. We can now, instead of calling invoke async on all of the clients and passing in send, we can define an interface, or oh, we're not in here. Oh. Let's just call it iChat. Cool. And so by doing this, we can now, oh, whoops. if we now make this, instead of just a generic hub, we can make it a hub of iChat. And now we get this awesome IntelliSense for our client methods. So you can see now we have send available to us because this hub uh, has to implement this interface. So now it's basically the same. And so instead of having to invoke async and pass in the method name, because we have this interface here, we get this cool IntelliSense and it just makes it a little nicer to look at. Uh, I'm just gonna go back. Cool. And then, oh, here. So on NuGet, uh, if you want to bring in like the SignalR server package, uh, if you just look up ASP.NET Core.SignalR, uh, you have to make sure to have this include pre release box checked because it is, a, as you can see here, 1.0.0 alpha final. Uh, so now if we go back to chat, so this looks good and this looks good. Let's get this going. It's going to work perfectly. So if we actually get another So we've got chat written in like two seconds, which is awesome. Hello, test. But now what we also want to do is I've got a console client. This uses, if we look at the CS proj, the, C, the Microsoft ASP.NET Core.SignalR.Client package that I mentioned in the previous slide. So if we get this running, and this is also going to work perfectly. Uh, we can say hello from the console. And then we've got it working there. And if I say hello, so now we've got our SignalR uh, C Sharp client working in the console and our SignalR JavaScript client working in the browser and they're both talking to each other using the server endpoint. So that's cool, it's kind of fun. Uh, if now I want to look at this next demo, which is slightly more interesting, uh, it's a whiteboard. I was watching a Seahawks game two weeks ago and it was awfully bad. So I just pulled out my computer and started writing this demo. 
<laughs> and so basically what we have, I'll go over the code in a second. All right, let's just start with the code. So basically what we have here <coughs> is based on, for browser compatibility, we'll decide, font. sorry? Increase font. Oh yeah, sorry, thank you. 150. Uh, so for browser compatibility, what we do, sorry? Okay, for browser compatibility, what we do is we first check if promise, it's kind of hacky, but uh, we basically are deciding, we're using whether promises are defined to determine whether we want to load the ES5 JavaScript client or just the regular one. And basically, what we have here is uh, a whiteboard example. So for, oh, I didn't even actually go over, if we want to decide, just go back super quickly to this, because I didn't actually even show you the client code. So uh, back to the chat, forget everything I just told you. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we have our connection, which is uh, basically establishing a signal or hub connection at this chat endpoint, which is where we defined that we wanted to map the chat hub. So if we go back to index, cool. Uh, so what we're basically saying is whenever the send method is called from the server and we want to run this code, this is the basically callback that we'll get, that we're registering, that gets triggered whenever the server says, oh, hey, clients, whoops, clients that all that invoke async send, it's telling all of the clients to run their respective send methods. So for here, basically what we do is we just take the data and create this new uh, element and append it to the list, which is how those chat messages are getting populated. And then, also to invoke the messages, the sending of messages, we just basically add this uh, event listener on the form and we just invoke send with the data that we're pulling from the form. So fast forward back to this, uh, basically what we have is a canvas whiteboard. So what we have is you can draw on this canvas and it basically uh, triggers the draw event on all other clients. So you can basically go here, select the color, and it'll trigger the draw callbacks on all the other clients. So you can do it with many more browsers. And so if we go back to the code, basically what we're doing is we have a, I'll show you the hub, which is pretty interesting. Uh, basically, it just takes uh, two coordinates and a color, and it draws a path between those two. And this is slightly different from the chat example, because in the chat example, we were kind of round tripping all the data, because we were saying just clients.all, and we weren't doing anything client side. We were just saying, send this data to the server, and then we'll, even for the messages that we send, We'll let the server get them and send them back. But what's happening here is we're saying <laughs> clients all accept. So invoke the draw method on all clients except yourself, which is the your current context connection ID. So it'll exclude your own so that you can do the drawing on your own client. And that all the others will get the information through the invocation of draw, which passes in all that data. So yeah, basically just on mouse move, we basically take these data points uh, and then take the color information as well and then invoke draw everywhere. And then that's essentially how you can get this interesting uh, whiteboard example. So let's stop this. Um, cool. Do you want to bring your? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's. It's the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have your sample posted somewhere? 
Yeah, so the uh, the whiteboard sample is actually at uh, GitHub, uh, ASP.NET Signal Art Samples. It's just under whiteboard. They have a lot of cool stuff. So yeah, that's using the Alpha 1 bits, and the Alpha 1 bits are dependent on the ASP.NET Core 2.0 RTM bits as well. So there are lots of cool samples there, but yeah, that one's right there. This is weird. Maybe just unplug it and plug it back. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. We know how to use Office. Yeah. We don't do that daily. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Macau, for. I thought the whiteboarding demo was pretty cool when I first looked at it. All right. So the runtime store. Uh, as promised, we come back to it. So. The dot all meta package is new in 2.0, and that's the only reference you require in your um, projects in order to get everything ASP.NET Core related. And the published output uh, is just your app and any third party depend dependencies you may have. So none of the ASP.NET Core stuff um, is published with their app. So the goal was to make your um, app smaller so your uh, published Azure is much faster. Okay, uh, another thing that we did as part of this work was <coughs> pre-compiled views and that was an option in 1.1 and it's on by default now. So if you have views um, in your application, they're pre-compiled so that helps with uh, startup time. All right. When your app is smaller, it means it also costs less to host as well, right? Yes, on Azure. So sure. big selling point. Okay. And if you're not going to Azure, does it compile the needed DLLs to distribute with your app? You can um, have the store hosted um, in your other cloud, and um, your app, if they have a dot all reference, then they know to look for the store. Okay. So um, the store actually is <coughs> part of your SDK. So when you go to the download page that we mentioned before. Uh, it comes in as part of that. So if you go to the store, you'll see that you have a bunch of these packages. And this is what all of your 2.0 applications are using. So if you open any of these up, uh, you'll see that there's the 2.0 package right there. So all, all your 2.0 applications are using the same store that is part of the SDK download. So the runtime store. Um, I wanted to show you how the 1.1 application differs from the 2.0 application. So as you can see in 1.1, you have to include all of the references that you need. You have to specify the various versions. Um, so not too bad, but it's, it can be a little annoying when you're developing and you need a certain reference and you might not know where a certain API lives. Um, for someone who's new, I had that problem at the beginning. Um, and then compare that to 2.0. This is all you need, and you have magic IntelliSense for everything related to ASP.NET Core. Um, if you don't like this idea, you can definitely have individual references. That's fine too. You can go back to it looking like this with version 2.0. That's fine. But this allows you to not have to worry about it. So you don't have to worry about, oh, which version of this package is compatible with this other package. So none of that. Um, and quickly, just to show you what the publish output size is, we're going to publish both of these. This is the 1.1 one, one application right now. We're going to look at um, what this looks like. I'm just publishing to a local folder. And then uh, Tua as well, we'll go over how that is so much more smaller. <coughs> All right, so let's take a quick look at what this looks like. All right, so as you can see, there's lots going on here. Everything that's ASP.NET Core is part of your published output. Um, and now let's go back and publish the 2.0 application. So there should be a stark difference. Like you can literally see 
that all you really publish with Truo is just your application here. So much smaller, um, it's just pre-compiled views and your application DLL. So let's look at the size real quick. This is about, let's say, <coughs> two, less than three megs, right? So um, compare that to the size of the one one application, which is about 17. So about four times reduction in what you're publishing to the cloud. So that's helpful. All right. Cool. Let's go back. The next thing um, I'm excited to sh show you guys is Razor Pages. So Razor Pages still has all of the goodness of MVC that you've seen before. Uh, model binding. So at the core, web is just a bunch of strings. Uh, how does ASP.NET MVC add value? We, cr we help you model bind it to C-sharp objects, which are nicer to use. Validation. Validation is um, when you have a certain form. Let's say you want the user email to look a certain way, or you require a certain number of certain length for some, out some input. You can do all of that client side or service side. Uh, filters, filters, how many of you guys use filters in MVC? Okay, not a lot, okay. So that's interesting. Filters are um, basically a way for you to avoid duplicating code throughout your application. Wait, wait, so you action filter attributes? Yeah, that's right. Action filter, result filters, exception filters. Where there are different kind of filters. You can write your own filters. Uh, so filters are for cross-cutting concerns throughout your application. And, and you can use them as attributes, so you can decorate your controllers and actions, and that's how you can use them. Um, so this allows you to not duplicate code if you're um, doing a certain thing, say, after every action or, after, or at each controller. Um, action results. So this is <laughs> when you are in your controller, you say, public I action result index. So I action result um, is a way for you to return, either redirect to a different location in your application or come back to your page. Um, tag helpers. Tag helpers are new to the whole uh, ASP.NET Core thing. Um, tag helpers allow you to run C sharp code um, in HTML. I actually like to show an example of that because um, I think they're really cool. And if you are interested in learning more, we do have uh, resources. So definitely, uh, if you haven't heard of them, uh, go to Channel 9 and look up Taylor Mullen. He is a guy behind Tag Helpers, and he has a lot of videos on Channel 9. You can definitely check those out. It goes into a lot of detail about how to use them. But uh, if you're more of a person who likes to read code and understand, definitely go to our MVC repository. There are some examples here. For instance, um, if you have looked at the layout page closely, let's go in here and take a quick look at one of these. So if you've looked at this page before, you might notice that some of these are purple. And that's how you know that's a tag helper. Um, and this is an environment tag helper. So if you are in development, certain links are rendered. If you are in staging or production, another set of links is rendered. So this um, gives you the power to write this kind of logic uh, in C-sharp. But in an HTML or a Razor page, you, it doesn't have to look all nasty with all of the C-sharp in here. It can look neat, and all of the code, all of the um, heavy lifting can be in C-sharp. So if, for instance, if you were to look at this environment in Tag Helper, this is where all of the um, rendering happens, where you are either suppressing the output because your environment is not the one you want, or you're um, letting it um, actually render the links. So this is where all of the heavy lifting can happen in C-sharp, and then it can look nice and tidy here. So. Those are, that's Tag Helpers. Yeah, there's some great videos on Channel 9 and on YouTube by, uh, like Jas mentioned, Taylor Mullen or 
uh, if you look at like tag helpers, Damien Edwards, on how to yeah. author your own tag helpers, which are really sort of simple to get started with. And I'd recommend if you yeah. are interested. There's also lots of documentation. So ASP.NET Core documents have walkthroughs as well. So definitely check them out. Um, you can still use the HTML helpers. And this Razor syntax is still the same with Razor pages. Um, so anything that you're familiar with, uh, logging, DI, cross-platform, still there with Razor Pages. But Razor Pages are single file script pages that can evolve into an MVVM model. So it has a better grow up story. So let's quickly like um, contrast MVC versus Razor. So I'm going to create a new application. And this gives me a chance to show you what the 2.0 experience is like now. So if you create a new project, let's, let's call it that, Web Application 3. So let's compare. So 1.1, one, one, um, the usual suspects, empty Web API or the MVC model. You can get templates and get started. In 2.0, oh, we've added a bunch of other cool stuff like React and Redux or Angular templates. And then here, there's a slight difference. If you go with the regular web application, you'll get started with the Razor Pages template. If you go to web application, the model view controller template, that would be the traditional MVC template. Um, and this is a good thing to know if you haven't seen it before. I'm guessing you guys are all experts here. So you've seen this before probably. So um, you can use uh, authentication, connect to the cloud or in, in app different types of authentication. All right, so I'm going to start with an MT20 application. And let's try to create just a Hello World MVC. And then we'll switch to Razor Pages. So with MVC, the one good thing about 2.0 is the dot all. So I don't need to add references. It's cool makes my life a little bit easier. So in here, um, I just need to add MVC to my services. And use MVC with default route. But in order to get started here, I have to add a folder I must call it controllers. That's the convention. I can add a controller class. And if you look in here, it has to be inherited from controller. And you must add views. And here, where it, it was kind of tricky for me to learn when I started with MVC, I need to have another folder, and it must match my controller name. I must call it home. And in here, I can then finally add my view. And let's say hello. So as you can see, there are a lot of conventions, things you must know. Um, and that was one of the things we wanted to tackle. So with Razor Pages, you don't need to have as much ceremony. So let's say we add a new project here, call it about one. Um, start with empty. And now let's see what you need to do for a Razor Pages application. In here, you would add a folder called pages. And then you can add your view. You could add razor page, that's the template, but let's, get, let's just start with the blank view page and see what you need to do. So in here, you need to add the directive add page. So MVC knows this is a razor page, not your regular view. And that's it. OK, so for the MVC application, mm -hmm. you have to have the controllers folder. Must. Yeah. And then you have to have the views folder. And then within that, you have to have 
that subsequent folder yeah. which matches. matches. Okay. But versus razor pages, mm -hmm. you only need that pages folder, and right. then from that, there's just it's a little more free free flowing. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. So. If um, I was just learning ASP.NET. Um, this would be much easier to do. If I go in here and let's see if this works. I'm going to control F5 in here. So it looks like your um, razor page, a, a razor view page, but the only thing that you need to um, add is the add page directive. That's how NBC knows it's a razor page. All right, so that works. That's cool. Um, now let's say you wanted to add some code, you would probably do like a code block here and say message, this is a razor page. And in order for you to actually render that, you have to put it here. Hmm. Oh, sorry, at functions. Oh yeah, of course, for, you're right. Thank you. I don't need this anymore. Yeah, so part of the uh, sort of thinking behind making Razor Pages, that first uh, web application template, was that just the reduced like structure in creating your application is just sort of a lower barrier for entry for new people starting. So if someone's just downloading ASP.NET Core and they want to make a web application, they click that, there's less sort of ceremony, uh, which is the word that we that you have to sort of follow to get something going. There are less sort of guidelines, or not even guidelines, restrictions <laughs> that will cause issues just because Razor Pages is more sort of flexible in that sense. Yeah, but it's not to say that it replaces MVC. MVC still has a value of separating concerns. Um, but if you're, um, let's say one of your uh, views is not very um, heavy on the logic for the controller, doesn't need a model, Razor Pages might be a better fit for that. And it's not to say that if you're re using Razor Pages, you cannot use MVC. You can create an, a hybrid of your choice that works for you. So in here, um, this would just render the message. So let's quickly take a look. Do you need to start? Let's change the yeah. Oh, did I? Should have worked. Right. Do you not have it in your startup? Oh, did I? No, you don't need to do anything in the startup. No, no, you're oh, yeah, that's true. That was my other app. You're right. Yeah. So I was just testing you guys. Yay. <laughs> you guys know. Yeah, I just completely forgot that I did it for the other app. OK, so you, you just need to say use MVC. Um, and that should work. Well, it's in your solution. You've got web app three as your startup project. Oh, okay. So you do need to still do services.addmvc and app.useMVC, um, but nothing else. So just how you would uh, configure an MVC application. All right. Now let's give it a shot. Okay, perfect. So that works. Thank you, guys. <laughs> um, and then you can imagine as your app gets a little bit more complicated or if you need to add more logic to your um, Razor page, you might want to do something like this where you add an app functions block. Um, you can create, let's say, a property. You call it message. And another thing that I want to mention about Razor Pages is the page handlers. So this is what a page handler would look like, kind of analogous to controller actions. But this is what you would have to do here. So let's say if I hit a get request for a page, this is what I want to do. I want to return this. 
and you would return the page back. All right, so it's happy now. Oh, I have to send passing. another message yeah, somehow. Passing. Passing. Oh, yeah. So you would return the message, I guess. You could do this. So set the message in your hand handler and return it any way you want. So you can imagine this getting more complicated. So let's actually look at a more interesting uh, example <coughs> of Razor Pages. So in here, I have a CRUD application where, um, actually, let's get this um, started here. So it's just. Um, a card application for you to register cards, edit them, or delete them. So it looks like your basic template. And all <coughs> you need to do is go to cars, and in here you can create something. Let's say this is my favorite car. And in here you can edit it. So just like you would use MVC, but I want you to pay a little bit more attention to the URL. So notice how all you need to do is be in the cars pages directory, uh, there's no notion of the controller name anymore. Um, so in here, you can just say the X. Um, that is temp data, like you've seen in MVC, works the same way. If I were to refresh it, it's gone. It's for one request. And then you can notice that there is a directory called pages. And because I want to call it cars, I can create a directory called cars. And here, I have different ways where you can have your C-sharp code. So for instance, for my create page, um, my create razor page looks like a view, and I can have a backend logic to it in a C-sharp file. So I can create another file. Um, I can name it anything I want. I just called it create.cshtml.cs because VS nicely nests it underneath it, so it's easy to find. But you can call it anything. Um, the C-sharp file can then have the model, and the model um, inherits from the page model class. So this is, looks kind of similar to a controller, um, but this is the MVVM factor method. Um, and then in the edit page, you can see I've put all of my C-sharp code in the at functions block. I don't need another file. If, if my logic is not too complicated, but I still have some C-sharp, you can choose to leave it in the same file as your form. So in, if you keep scrolling, that's a lot of code. So that might be a good uh, place for me to move it to a C-sharp file. But you also have your <coughs> form right underneath it. So that's another option. And then you can also choose to not have a page model. Um, in here, I'm just directly interfacing with my database. I don't have my, anything that inherits from page models. So you can do that as well. And another cool thing that I want to point out is how this routes. So your pages are routed or accessed uh, depending on where they live on disk. So to get to this um, uh, index page, I don't really need anything special. But let's say I instead wanted this to be called something else. I want to call it awesome. Or I want this to be the route where this page lives. All I need to do is specify that up here. So let's take a quick look, go back to this, and let's try to do this. So as you can see, that's not going to work now. So let's try to go to awesome. So in order for me to edit how I access my pages, I just need to be aware of, I just need to change this guy. OK, so when you added that awesome string after like the at page directive. Yeah. Instead of uh, rendering the message, it was just writing what was uh, written by default in yeah, the in my startup. startup. So okay. this is what happened because it couldn't find the index page anymore because I want it to be called awesome now. Um, it it, uh, it 
I guess that's the fallback. So that's what ran instead. So in here, let's say I wanted it to be called super slash awesome. So I'm going to add a folder in here, call it super. And in here, I will move the index page. And if I go back now, that doesn't work. What does work? Super slash awesome. And cool. there. So you can prefix or you can add a suffix. So, um, I mean, you don't have to necessarily create this. Um, you could just have um, something in here and call it that. Super, so now it will super go, no, it should be super, super duper, not duper, super. So if you wanted it to be super duper awesome, but you don't want to create directories, you don't have to. So if you were to put it back to the pages, now go, try to go back, doesn't exist. Super duper awesome. There we go. So you can control how you get access to these. Another cool thing is, let's for a second pretend that your app um, is in production. And let's go to the folder. Um, let's say you want to add a new um, Razor page. What you can do is, I have this created here. I'm just going to drop it. Um, let's see. Let's go to our app. Try to go to, I call my file dropped. So now, without having to stop my app from production, I just dragged and dropped a file and I can now access it. So if I go in here, that's, that's what we saw. So you can uh, easily just have a razor page added to your app later once you have it ready. Um, and you could also have constraints. Like, let's say I am expecting an ID, which is int. try that um, and now if I oh sorry <coughs> I think there needs to be that there we go so now it's expecting some sort of ID you can then choose to get this information and use it as you want um, in your Razor page. But now because it's expecting an int, it's not going to work if you put in a non-int. So that's not going to work, but any int will work just fine. All right. So it doesn't fail, but it just won't find the page because it's expecting it. And yeah, because it has the fallback code that it runs. Yeah. All right, so that's Razor Pages. Some of the things that I'd like to point out with our car crud app was, all right, so in here you'll notice how I have this added, and that's the filter that I mentioned before. And um, the purpose of this is just to show you that it still works like it did in MVC. So I all I have here is a very simple filter, a result filter attribute, and um, it's just adding a header to my request. So that's all I did in here. I added this header. So if I were to go to the create uh, racer page, this would be added. Um, let's take a look actually. Where did that so there it is. So if I will have the dev tools and if I create oops. So if I look in here, okay, that's not the place. It's after I create it. So yeah. if I go to this guy and save it, sorry. So that's the response header I added. So this is a, an example of a filter. Okay, and another thing would be um, bind property. So 
because now we don't really have a notion of a model, um, buying property is what tells your razor page that this is the property you want bound to your form. So if you were to look inside the form, um, I have a directive at model, create model, and now in here I have the nice IntelliSense that I can use here. And this, this is how the form binds to your car property. So this is important. Um, and we saw the temp data before, how it lasts for one request, same thing as MVC. All right, so that's Razor Pages. Uh, is it, they have uh, partial pages or shared pages, include pages and other pages, like with MVC? Yes, that is, I believe, still supported. Um, I will uh, just confirm and get back to you, but I think everything uh, that you know of MVC, including those, um, is, is supported. Is there a formal documentation all these syntactic elements. I mean, what you show looks very nice, but the documentation on the Microsoft website has just grown to incredibly huge. Mm -hmm. So, is there some place to go to find where the formal documentation is? Not something that refers to something back in version I see. one or something like that. Yeah. It so, says, yes, very clearly, this is what it is in version two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Docs.microsoft.com. Uh, there's a lot of work going into making that really easy to use. There's a really well-written ASP.NET Core section, which has all the stuff, and it's been updated for 2.0. So if you just look up ASP.NET Core docs, it, that should be the first thing that shows up, mm -hmm. and that should really answer most of your questions. And there's actually a really recent video by um, one of our senior devs who's worked on Razor Pages. So if you go to Channel 9, and if you look for Ryan Novak, he um, is a senior dev who's um, worked on this, and that should give you all of the latest stuff as well. And if you guys know Damien Edwards, he also has um, a sample on his GitHub page. Thank you. Yeah. So Tag Helper components. Um, so we've seen what Tag Helpers are a little bit. Um, actually, let me just show you the demo, because it's easier that way. So. I'm going to set this as startup because apparently I forget to do that. Um, all right, so with Tag Helper components, um, the one thing I'd like to first go over is how do you write a Tag Helper component? And then we can see it in action. So <coughs> I am implementing the iTag Helper component interface, um, which has an order, it has an initialized method, and a process async method. Um, order is important if you have multiple components. Let's say you have a certain head or body HTML tag and you want to insert or inject multiple JavaScript or other HTML. And order is important then because then you can specify how you'd like them <coughs> to be rendered in which order. Um, and then let's quickly go over this piece of code. So process async is where um, I'm doing the, the work here. What I'm doing is uh, getting my current context. So in right now, um, my, HTM, my tag helper has a certain tag name. If it's body, um, that satisfies my condition right here. And if it contains a certain attribute, um, I want to append HTML of my choice. So something that I want injected. So Tag helper components can be global, so you can have all of your body tags in, in your application be affected, or you can be specific by doing things like this, where you're saying only do it if it satisfies this extra condition. So now you're not doing it globally, you're being specific about where. And here I'm just appending some HTML to my current context. Um, and the cool thing is that you can do it from anywhere in your application. So you could be in the controller, and all you really need is have your constructor get the Tag Helper Component Manager, which is um, part of the services container by default. 
So if you have a controller that needs DAG helper components, um, you need access to it. So you just need this constructor. Um, and once you do that, you can use this extension method here that allows you to add a tag helper component of your choice. So in here, um, as you can see, I've used the one I was showing you right now. So this is what I'm calling here. And in here, I've defined my order to be zero. And there's a certain HTML that I'm appending. So you can imagine this being a script of some sort. You could do this also from a view. So if you are in a view, and depending on certain circumstances in your view, you want um, tag helper components injected, um, again, you would need a reference to it. So add inject allows you to do that in your, uh, in your razor page here. So manager.components.add. And same thing, I'm specifying an order. Um, if you wanted it to be global and you didn't want to worry about it or you didn't, have, you didn't want to think about which controller or which view, you could add it as part of the services container. So you could um, <coughs> um, add it to the collection right here. So in here, I'm adding the my implementation of iTag helper component to the services. So um, let's see this in action, and then I'll talk more. So what I'm expecting right now is because this is where I have my body tag with this inject attribute, I want to see all of these components that I've added in here, so in my add component file. So if I go home, add component, I can see these rendered, but just to show you where, now let's look at the code. So there is a body tag here, but because it didn't satisfy my condition of having the inject attribute, uh, nothing's um, changed. But in here, this body tag did have this attribute. So that's where all of my code is injected. So all of the scripts that I wanted, for instance, would be here. OK, so you're able to conditionally add these tag helper components onto the different HTML tags. Yeah, so head and body is what we ship with. But let's say you wanted um, certain scripts in the footer. How would you do that? So super easy way would be to, let's say, we add a class, call it uh, my tag helper. And let's actually go and take a look at some code. So this is the code that allows us to target head. This is in our MVC repository. I literally need the same code, but instead of my HTML target element being head, I'm going to change it to footer. And that's how I can target footer. And you can do it for any other HTML tag. So let's just take some of this with us. Actually, let's just take this guy. <laughs> and so you can change this name. Yeah. Extend from tag. Yeah. You need to implement this guy. and add some usings. And this is important. So we're targeting a different element. So let's say footer. Yep. Just add some usings right here. All right. Um, so this is just to say that um, I don't want my footer or whatever tag helper I'm on to be purple. So because it doesn't really add any value. The reason we would have um, this to we have have this set to not never would be, let's say for environment tag helper, we want it to look like a tag helper. Um, that's where it would be something else and not never. All right, so 
let's try this out. Um, and in my tag helper, because now I want my footer targeted, I can change this here. And that's all I need to do. So now we're saying if my context is a footer, I want um, the HTML appended. All right. So if we go back to our page, we, we did change some uh, C-sharp files, so I'm going to restart it. Take a look at home at component, you can still see it. But now, yeah. because we want to target footer, all of our scripts are injected in the footer tag. Okay, interesting. So out of the box, there was support for tag helper component for head and body, mm -hmm. but you're able to just really easily make it a new tag helper component mm -hmm. that now targets the footer. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then you could change that to be whatever. Any other HTML tag. Cool, awesome. Right. Okay, that's Stack Helper Components. Okay. Um, one last thing. Application Insights. So, Application Insights collects events from a running application, and it provides you with actionable insights. Uh, it looks at your performance and it provides instant analytics. So it looks at the telemetry of how is that being used. Um, and you can see um, things like server, server response time or what were status codes for all of these different requests. And you can dive deeper and find root cause of certain problems that you encounter. All right, so let's quickly take a look at what the VS experience is like. Is this debug time only or runtime? Um, this is like live production as well. So it depends on how you configure it. But um, here you can get, um, to, in order to find these windows, the easiest way would be to control Q, look for search. Well, right now the internet's being a little slow, but if you um, wait for it to show you all the, the list, it would be application inside search. And you, another window to look for would be trends. So, if it, so this is where you would take, get this access to all of the data. Hmm. As we know, the internet always works perfectly when you're in front of a crowd presenting. <laughs> so, okay. While we're waiting for that, quick question: How many people have ever used the ASP.NET uh, proxy uh, NuGet package? Anyone? Okay, cool, not important. How many people have used the HTTP override packages? I know people have used them. They have tons of downloads. Those are my intern projects way back in the day. I was hoping people would use them. I guess not. But, uh, <laughs> what, what is the description of both of them? Oh, yeah, sure. So the uh, proxy project, you can find it. It wasn't actually ever like fully released. It's still in like zero, version 0 0.2. Uh, has 27,000 downloads on NuGet, people do use it, um, but it's just uh, essentially just like a request forwarder. Uh, you can just basically set uh, like a back end. Well, like what I did for my uh, intern presentation was uh, I basically had, it, I set it up as like a telemetry proxy. So it was like a, essentially a man in the middle, you'd like request that proxy site and then it would send you to the telemetry site and it would show the different types of requests that were going through. Uh, and then there was also uh, the HTTP uh, header forwarders. So basically, if you were, you could use that in conjunction with the proxy to uh, set uh, the different headers uh, into like the X uh, over. Like basically, you could set like different headers, and it would set them, and so that when you put them, uh, when you set configured a proxy, it would set them, and then you could bring them back. So that one actually has like a bajillion downloads, like two million. So people do use them, I a promise. <laughs> yeah, right. I just, I checked it like last week and I was like, oh yeah, I remember writing this. And then I was like, two million, what in the world? I need to be paid more. <laughs> All right, so this is what the experience looks like in Azure. Um, it's very similar in VS as well. So you can get um, insights into what your, what the API request looks like to your API. Um, and you can dive deeper into each of these. Right now, the internet's not working, but let's 
Okay, there we go. But um, you could find out more information. Uh, where where was your user? What the different telemetry data is? Okay, that's not working. So this is what it would look like if it were working. <laughs> so you can get a look at server response times. You can um, customize your dashboard. So this is what I did. I looked at server response time and how long was it taking to load the page, um, et cetera. And then you can dive into which request took more, more than a certain time or less than a certain time and why. Um, and this is what it would look like. So this you can get insight into where your app pages were being hit. So what, what, what endpoint is being hit and then you can get information about what the status code, et cetera, is like. And this is what it, um, the application map looks like. So if you have a more interesting application than just one application, that's, let's say it connects to a database or some other API, this is where you would get to see the graphic of what, what your app is connected to. Okay, awesome. All right. So okay, redemption question. Has anyone used the URL rewrite module? Yeah. Oh, okay, we got some hands. Uh, that wasn't an intern project that I had, but that was the project that I started on when I started. It was someone else's intern project, but I had to bring it to like production quality. I just felt like I didn't see any hands before. I had to get that one in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, oh, yeah. uh, so here we just have links to a couple of resources. So just dot, dot .NET and the .NET architecture page. Uh, you can check those out on your own time. And there's the next slide, which... Oh, sorry. Ooh. I was going to show them the .NET architecture. Okay, cool. Ads. Yeah. We don't okay, another thing would be the community standard. Without yeah, this is... Uh, Hanselman does go to these ones. Uh, they're just live stream. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's usually like Hanselman... This is being recorded. <laughs> uh, this is... Uh, Usually, Damian Edwards, John Galloway, and Scott Hanselman, they basically talk about different things happening in the community. So they go through a bunch of different new blog posts that were released, different, uh, different packages, just a lot, basically anything new that's happening with uh, .NET Core and ASP.NET Core, they talk about. Uh, it's really cool. It's usually pretty funny. It lasts about an hour. It's every week. And uh, yeah, you can, basically, Scott tweets about them. So I'm sure people have probably heard of them. Okay, I'm going to go to this link right now. Cool. You want to talk about this one? Sure. It opens up. So these are um, our application architecture guides. And um, my boss was pretty persistent that I ask you guys to give us some feedback. So if you get a chance, um, check these out. Please take a look. And if there's anything we can add or improve, let us know. So these are um, how to get started with some of these services. So thank you. And that would be it. I think that's it. Yeah, live.asp.net is the community standard page that we were showing. Uh, GitHub.com, that ASP.net, or slash ASP.net, that's like the home of uh, all of our open source stuff for ASP.net Core. And then, yeah, the link get ASP.net, that will basically take you to the point where you can download uh, the version of ASP.net that works for you. Uh, yeah, and then there's just the blogs for announcing what's new in uh, ASP.NET Core 2.0. Yeah, so just Google ASP.NET Core 2.0 show up. It's going to be hard to remember this link. <laughs> All right, thank you for joining. Yeah, thanks so much. Oh, sure. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> well, in that case. <laughs> All right. Cool, thank you. <laughs> okay, let's do this and uh, um, do the valuable prizes and get out of here because we know uh, a thirsty lion.